Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at FreeBSD, only this time 12.2 is the release right after this. So, uh, I guess last week, uh, FreeBSD uh, put out a new release. They, they take their time, and usually about six to eight months is usually about normal for them uh, to put out point releases. And, of course, they are busily working on version 13 as well. But <clears throat> their point releases are usually not just minor improvements. There's usually something that's pretty amazing that they do in each one of these. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time and kind of cover some of the things that are new. So, I mean, <clears throat> obviously there's a lot of security fixes that have gone into 12.2R. And if you want to see all of those, <laughs> go to the release notes, because there's a very long list of not only security fixes, but also, you know, bug fixes, what they call errata. And, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, there's a, it's a pretty long list. It's on their page. But one of the... Uh, now, I've seen, I've seen some articles by Michael Lucas. He does a lot of writing uh, about FreeBSD and some of the software. And he has a book that's out about jails. And I remember him mentioning this, that you could run Linux inside of a jail. But this release actually supports it. Now... Running Linux inside of a jail is not simple. <laughs> so you might find it more trouble than it's worth, um, but the, it, it will do it. Uh, most people just say, well, just put it under a VM and kind of be done with it. Uh, but it is there, and I'll probably try it sometime down the road here. But then, uh, just like on some of the other Linux releases, uh, Vert.io Block now adds trim support, which is pretty good. Uh, BSD utilities have all been upgraded, uh, and those are always those are all the commands that are both supplied uh, f from the BSD group as well as the utilities that come in as contri contributed software. So. Yeah, the user land utilities have all been updated with new releases and uh, <laughs> probably new features as well. Uh, also, the C Lang or Clang, if you prefer that, uh, LLVM, LLD, LLDB, the compiler runtime utilities, and the libc++, all been updated to 10.0.1. So we now have faster compilers for FreeBSD as well. One of the future notes that they put in for uh, version 13, now that's not happening in this release, it's coming in the next release, and they always do things like that, warn you ahead of time that, hey, there's these changes that are coming. But 12.2 <clears throat> is the last release that'll support a CPU type of i386. Uh, you know, personally, I. I suppose there's probably somebody out there that's running on that old hardware, but my gosh, that's probably, uh, what, uh, late 80s, early 90s? I mean, that, that has got to be some really old hardware. Uh, and of course, but they're not getting rid of the 32-bit, so don't think that. They're just, that old hardware is just being slid off of the, of the rails, and they'll update the CPU type as the minimum for 486 and 686. So you still have 32-bit support in FreeBSD, so don't worry about that. It's just that uh, that old CPU type is gone. I'm trying to think, do I have a 386 around anymore? No, I don't. Uh, the last, the oldest machine I had was a Pentium 4, and that's gone. <clears throat> so that yeah, it's similar to what other Linux distros are doing. Uh, and it doesn't re affect the re current releases of release 11 and, and release 12. So that's something that will be coming down the pike. Um, the requirements is a 64-bit Intel or AMD processor <clears throat> for x86-64 support. And that will take, uh, you know, I said this before, this is the same as it was in 12.1. 
96 megabyte of memory, and they recommend two to four gigabytes if you're going to put a GUI on it. Uh, now, I I have not observed that small of a memory footprint when I install their distro out of the box. So I think you have to strip it down to get there. To get there, but uh, yeah, um, that's a pretty small footprint. 1.5, at least in this day and age, uh, 1.5 gigabyte of disk space and 8 gig is recommended. Uh, also, they they do this currently supports i386, 32-bit PowerPC, MIPS, Spark 64, ARM, and there is support for RISC-V as well, and that was true last time. So nothing particularly new there. Um, <clears throat> FreeBSD was initially released in November of 1993, and in fact, uh, it is uh, the latest re release was, of course, in October of 2020. But it is based on Research Unix, and and Unix just had a 50th birthday back on January the first of uh, 2020, of course, because 1970 was the first official release uh, to the public of uh, Unix. So yeah, 50 years that's been a long time. Uh, yeah, that predates my career, I'm afraid. I didn't. I missed the uh, initial <laughs> release of Unix. Uh, intended for uh, servers, workstations. Uh, you can do embedded systems. They do IoT devices. They, of course, do network firewalls. You know, PFSense is obviously based on FreeBSD and storage servers like what is now going to be called TrueNAS. Uh, but uh, TrueNAS, I believe, is moving over to Debian. But FreeNAS is still based on FreeBSD. So... Uh, yeah, so, yep. Uh, I'm not going to cover a lot of this. This is kind of from before on the last time. I mean, the the Linux license is quite different from, from Linux. Uh, Linux, if you make a change to any of the source code, you have, you're required to give it back. Uh, FreeBSD, you're not. That's the big difference between them. Now, there are pros and cons to both sides of that that question, and so I don't want you to think that one is better than the other. It is just different. Um, also, FreeBSD is 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 more than just the kernel and a few utilities. I mean, and it is everything. So everything is done by the group. So everything is released together. It's all done by the same group. Whereas in Linux, your distro is usually a collection of packages that are brought together by somebody that's holding that distro and organizing it. And the kernel, of course, comes from the Linux Foundation. That is not true. And then you have some utilities, of course, that come from the GNU Foundation as well. So, <clears throat> yeah, there's, uh, and FreeBSD is not like that. It's not, you know, gather everything together and make a big mess out of it. It's, like we do in Linux, but uh, it is a comprehensive release with everything in it. Uh, <clears throat> FreeBSD is free and open source software, um, and but it, it, it but like I said, the license is sl slightly different. Some of the new things in in 12.2 is they have updated GNOME to 3.38. Uh, KDE to 20.08 and XFCE to 4.14, OpenBox 3.6.6, Fluxbox 1.3.7, and I think that's a f number five patch release. DWM is 6.22 and BSPWM is 0 0.9.10. That's what I could gather from the distro itself. So I actually went in and captured that information myself. Now, I mentioned this the last time. There are a number of BS, free BSD spinoffs. Uh, Apple's Darwin, which forms, formed the basis of the Mac OS, iOS, tvOS. There's pieces even of it in watchOS and, uh, uh, and of course, FreeNAS. The OS is also used by the Sony PlayStation. It, it's been used since PlayStation 3, and even the new PlayStation 5 is based on FreeBSD. So FreeBSD can run most software that runs on Linux, uh, and uh, they also implement a trusted layer. Uh, they have jails for their containers. Uh, Docker, to my knowledge, does not run on FreeBSD. There is quite a difference in the architecture that Docker requires and what jails provide. So uh, <clears throat> jails is a, a very good container layer uh, that offers isolation as well. There's a, a virtualization. Now you can you can use uh, utilities uh, like 
uh, VirtualBox will run on FreeBSD. But they also have Beehive, or if you prefer, prefer Behave, it, it, I've heard it both ways. Uh, and of course, OpenZFS is supported natively. And in fact, you can install a root file system on ZFS if you wish. Uh, they were one of the first that, that implemented mandatory access controls. They have support for access control list, lists. Uh, and they also implement the NSA's Flask TE, which is the baseline for SE Linux uh, as well. So, uh, yeah. Uh, they also have Sun's basic security module. And I talked about that last time, OpenBSM. Uh, BSM was what Sun developed, and then it was rolled into the open source community as OpenBSM. It's a very good security module, uh, probably one of the best in existence, uh, in my humble opinion. And they have a very comprehensive security audit system. In fact, uh, most of the systems I'm familiar with use the uh, audit system that was provided by Sun initially and incorporated into FreeBSD. Uh, it is, it's not the same code, though. It's it's just, you know, it's it's FreeBSD. Is, well, anyway, we'll get into that, I guess. Uh, there's a number of shells that come with it. You can use T, T shell for root, uh, shell for users, the board shell, or the board, not the born again shell. This is the true shell. This is actually the born shell. <clears throat> but you can also put on other ones. There's fish, there's Z, ZSH. Um, or Z shell. Uh, K shell comes in two flavors in the original 93 version, and there's a newer version called uh, K shell 2020 if you wish to try out a more modern version of K shell. Uh, C shell as well are all available. Uh, and then, as I had mentioned last time, there is a Linux compatibility layer. This is not an emulator, it is actually it will run Linux binaries natively under the umbrella. So you can you have Deb and you have RPM that you can use to install packages and actually run them on FreeBSD. Uh, it, but it also supports the BSD OS. That's the original BSD uh, 4.4 that came from Berkeley. Originally, it runs those binaries as well as at and System 5 release 4 binaries as well. It is a monolithic kernel and it supports threads by the thread model that is uh, a one-to-one -one model. Uh, threading uh, uh, threading uh, architecture and it supports SMP and SMT. So yeah, uh, those are not those aren't really anything that isn't common to Linux as well. Uh, although the threading model under Linux is slightly different. If you look at my internals, you'll see that <clears throat> the scalable event notification is called KQ. And if you're writing an event manager, you probably will run into that. Now, <laughs> I did try to install this on hardware. So let me explain what happened. So <clears throat> I tried to install it on the NUC. The uh, base install went great. It, it, it's, it took off and it ran uh, without a GUI. I mean, it ran as a server. It runs fine. No problem at all. When I tried to install GNOME, however, things went horribly wrong. <laughs> um, Xorg runs fine, but... The, I, I, I'm, I, this is, I, I haven't dug into this, but this is what I suspect is happening here. That NUC has Thunderbolt, and I think it may be seeing it, because when Dbus is attempting to allocate the video screen, this, there's a screen allocator that, that comes in and assigns the, the video device to screen zero of Xorg so that you can then see the GUI. But when it comes up, it gets confused. It sees more than one, and it goes, I don't know which device ID is the one you want. Now, the only other video channel that I'm aware of on that device would be the one that's embedded in Thunderbolt. So I think it might be seeing that and getting confused. It wants me to assign a device ID. I don't know which one to assign, so I'll have to do some <laughs> research to find that out. So in the meantime, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're going to have to do this on a VM. Sorry about that, but uh, I did try. Um, I was not successful. <laughs> the NUCs are just kind of cantankerous when it comes to doing Linux. They, yeah, they're just a little bit that way. So I'll be right back. I want to get set up here. Okay, so the first place you would need to go is to the FreeBSD org site. 
<clears throat> and just to point out a couple of things here, um, so you're obviously <laughs> this, this large yellow uh, glaring download BSD is where you would go to download it. And <clears throat> you do have some choices here. You can in, you can download installer release images, or if you're going to put this on a virtual machine, you could do that. Uh, although I think there's some. Yeah, this has got just a, it has Hyper-V, Zen, VirtualBox, VMware, QEMU, KVM, and Beehive. So embedded in there. So you can use, if you have one of those running, you can just deploy it that way. I'm going to do this from the installer uh, just because I like to. And then there's some SD card images if you have a Raspberry Pi. Now, they do support Raspberry Pi 4. So it, it does not show that. It shows RPI-B, which is the original, and then RPI-3 but when I and RPI-2. But when I was looking at the actual images, there is a RPI-4 as well. So, And then there's some others here like Pine64 and Pine64 LTS are also supported. So you can now run FreeBSD on your Pinebook if you wish to do that. <clears throat> And I think that was, yeah, that's been the case since 12.1. So uh, I'm going to, you would grab the AMD if you have an Intel processor that's 64 bit. And then you have a couple of options here. You can do a boot only. This has a full set of uh, utilities and all that stuff on it. And then you have a memstick image, and then you have a minimal memstick image. So if you just want to boot from a memstick, uh, PFSense does that uh, where you can actually just boot up a minimal version of the server and then <clears throat> utilize the rest of it. It, it. I mean, if you're doing it that way, that's fine. But if you're going to install the desktop, you'll need that one, which has, of course, GNOME and XFCE and all those other guys in it. So I've already done that. So I don't need to do that again. The only other thing to show you is the documentation that you will need. Now, the Porter's Handbook, this is for people that are running ports. Uh, ports, I've explained this the last time, is it's source code and you compile the, the source code into, this is the way we used to do Unix. We, we didn't have packages back in the day. We got the source code and we compiled it. That's how we did things. So, uh, and so if you want to follow kind of the traditional Unix way of installing packages, you can use ports. But if you want to use the modern way, go to the handbook, and it, in there it will get you started, talks a little bit about the project, how to do the installation, some of the things in here about, you know, your install and the disk space and getting the distribution and your accounts and your network interfaces, and if you run into any issues. Then there's some basics. This is very good introduction <clears throat> to, you know, how things kind of work under Unix. It isn't a whole lot different than Linux, but it's just different enough that if you're trying to use Linux commands, you'll <laughs> you'll probably run into a few that it, it's not quite the same. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of been the norm for uh, the the BSD side of things. Even when I was working for AT and T, there was quite a few differences between BSD and AT and T Unix. After a certain point, they kind of diverged a little bit in some of their command structure. Not too much, but <clears throat> things like PS were kind of frustrating because it was minus EF on Unix, on AT&T Unix, and uh, PS minus AUX on BSD, on TrueBSD. So then if you want to install your X Windows and your desktop environment, and then there's just some common tasks here, like setting up, you know, your sound card and you're getting video playback to work and... And if you need to change the kernel, and you'll find that times that you'll want to do that, there, there are variables in the kernel that are set for, that are good for for user use, but not, maybe not enough for a system so to be used as a server. So you might, yeah, you might want to tweak those from time to time, uh, and then you could build that custom kernel. It, it is not a difficult process under BSD. Uh, just take your time with it. Um, it doesn't take as long as it used to, I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, it, it, compiling a, a, a BSD kernel back in the day would, would take hours. <laughs> it's not that anymore. It's minutes now. But 
Yeah, done that a few times, and I remember when those old slow machines took a while. <laughs> they took a while. Uh, if you have a printer you want to set up, and then it talks about the compatibility layer. And then you get into the basic system. I mean, this is a very good manual. Uh, some of the very basic, uh, you know, configuration and tuning here. And then <clears throat> there are some variables like there are on Linux that are dynamic. So you can, and the, they work under sys control as well, sys CTL. So you can configure those variables in on the fly, and then the kernel will pick them up immediately. So once you've done the sys control minus p to read them back in. So, yeah, there are a number of variables like that, but there are some that you don't, don't have those in there. So, like if you need a special module or something. The, the booting process, it, there's very few places that explain this anymore. Uh, so, yeah, and then how to shut it down. And, and it is unique. It is not the same as Linux does it. There's, uh, there's security on FreeBSD is excellent. I mean, it, it's, uh, there are... There are systems like there's hardened BSD, which is based on FreeBSD, which hardens, gives you a hardened kernel. Uh, I think the last version of that was 12.0, uh, but I saw some notes on his site that he is working actively on 12.2. So I don't, I don't know how long it takes him to do the, all those hardening steps that he does, but. If you're interested in a hardened version of BSD, hardened BSD is free BSD that's just been hardened. Uh, <clears throat> but like I said, it's based on 12.0, not 12.2 yet. Not yet. <clears throat> You'll need a lot more information than this for jails. I can tell you it is. Um, there, for, you know, just getting started, it's pretty simple. But when you get into more complex types of things with it, because it will do an awful lot. So uh, I would recommend Michael Lucas's book on jails. Uh, I think it's called Mastering Jails or Jails Mastery. Uh, you can find that on Amazon. And it is an excellent book. And it goes through all, most all of the different iterations that you can use for jails. My, uh, Michael Lucas is, uh, he, he is an excellent writer. He's written a number of books on ZFS and BSD as well. So um, yeah, uh, I have no qualms recommending his stuff. It's very good. So anyway, we could go on and on and on with that, but you can read about it. And then there's a basic storage and this just goes on and on. And there's ZFS, there's networking, firewalls, it just, it's a comprehensive manual. What can I say? I mean, uh, it's, there's a, Debian is probably close to being as good as this, uh, and yeah, they're, I would say maybe neck and neck. The uh, Debian's administrator manual and this one are probably close. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, they've always had really good documentation on, on uh, the way their system works. And they kind of pride themselves on that. Um, yeah, the thing you have to remember is that a lot of these guys that do this stuff and ladies too that work on this, um, they do it for free <laughs> pretty much. So uh yeah, don't get too mad at them. I mean, they are doing this, you know, kind of out of their spare time. So, all right. So, I'll uh, just put that away for now, and we'll start here. I've already been playing around with it a little bit, but we'll start afresh, like always. I'm going to choose an image file, and I've got to go to my downloads to get it. There's my release 12.2. I'm going to give this about four gig and I won't need this much because I'm going to be using ZFS, but I'll give it about 35, I guess, and maybe 36 is fine. And, uh, and then we'll, we're done. So we'll go ahead and create it. I am going to install this on ZFS this time. Um, and this is a C, a C level program, so you'll notice that this does not take long to come up. <clears throat> I mean, it's already started the install, so, uh, excuse me, the boot. Okay, so we get this, uh, this also is written in C. And um, you can choose uh, your favorite key map. So if it's not one of the default ones, like it's saying US is what it's defaulting to, it's pick that out. 
I know that it does a pretty good job with picking out uh, based on your country location, but if for some reason it doesn't, and, and these aren't all perfect, so let's see. I'm going to call this free four. And I'll, you do have to either use local host or, uh, or have a, a fully qualified domain, or your network will not start. I'm telling you, it won't. Then you can have some cho choices here you can make. If you are interested in ports, you can select that, which will then install the ports tree where you can then compile your, your packages if you wish. But this is all I need. Uh, and I'm going to go down to Auto ZFS. Now, you can put a normal... UFS is the Unix file system. It's been around a long time. It's a very... Uh, a very good file system. Um, but for today, we're going to do auto ZFS. And I only have I only have one drive, so we have to do a stripe zero. There's no redundancy. I mean, you can look at this. It says no. Re it's striped. It's no redundancy. If it, you're, it's just like a normal install. If your drive fails, you're out of luck. So I have a backup. And then it says, okay, I found one drive. Is that the one you want to use? And you just hit the space bar and put the asterisk in it and you're good to go. So we'll proceed with the install and it's giving me one last chance. Are you sure you want to destroy this disk? Yeah, go ahead, wipe it out. I don't care. It's all virtual anyway, so I don't care. What are you going to do? So this won't take too long. <clears throat> It'll actually start. Now, BSD does a three part. It does a fetch then it extracts the files and then it installs them. So, and that that is true for every package that comes down. It first does the fetch and then I'll do an extract install, extract install, extract install. Yep, that's just the way it works. Hey, it's a lot better than the way I had to install Unix, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Actually, the 3B2 wasn't too bad. It had a tape, and uh, it, it really wasn't that bad. I mean, a cartridge tape, not a reel-to-reel. -reel. Yeah, you had a floppy drive that drove it, and then you just, it just said, put the, when it was ready to, to, uh, to push the files onto the disk, it just said, uh, insert the disk, and then take the disk out, put the tape in. Now, we'll tell you when to do the next the next, uh, the next uh, C, uh, uh, disc, diskette. All right, no, <clears throat> so that's fine. It's, it's, that's fine. I don't need anything else. Um, I do have to come down here to the US. There it is. <clears throat> and then select my time zone. <clears throat> skip, skip, that looks good. If there's some of this that you want, then you can install it right now. Or in this case, I don't need anything else. If you have specific needs for security, uh, if you have, you know, you want to hide your jails or your UIDs or what have you, you can do that here or enable a secure council. Uh, yes, I do. So I probably should do that. I'll add the user and then my full name. That's fine. I'm, I am going to add myself to wheel. You need that if you want to be able to SU. Uh, if you leave that off, you won't be able to SU, but you will be able to log in as root. So, uh, so j just keep that in mind that, it, that this sudo is not installed by default. You have to do that. This is a little bit like Arch where you have to build things up. It'll put some of it out there for you. Yeah, no, no. Okay. And do I want to, and I mentioned this last time, if you want to lock, a lot of admin, admins do this in corporate environments because the employee isn't on site yet, so they'll lock the account out so that some other user doesn't see it and grab it. Those, those dirty users. Okay. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right, so if you, you can go back and modify anything so, or you can go down and install the handbook. It's the same handbook that's on the website. I'm done. Do I want to open a shell? Nope. I don't have any drivers that I need to install. Usually that's where you would do that. Um, 
and I can just reboot it. Now this is not going to come up in a GUI. I'm just telling you that ahead of time. This is right now what you have here is a server. We haven't converted it to a workstation yet. Okay, and then we'll go ahead and let it boot up. I wasn't sure if it was going to put mine in front of the old one. <laughs> but it did. It stuck it in front. I think the other one I named free number three, which doesn't make any sense. I would think I would have put that one first, but oh well. Okay, so I have my login prompt. And I am logged in. Now, there's a bunch of information here that if you're interested in, uh, like if you want to read the release notes, you can go here. Uh, if you want to know about, now they're just like everyone, all the, like Debian and some of them that publish their vulnerabilities. So if a vulnerability is fine, they're open about it. Um, and and I, I always respect distributions and, and, re, and systems. And this is not a distribution, this is a system. So, uh, so I, an operating system like this, I always have respect for people that do that because that builds up trust, right? You're not trying to hide anything from me. You're not saying, oh my God, I don't want anyone to know that I've had security vulnerabilities because every operating system has security vulnerabilities. We're all humans and with that right code. So, and that's what you get. All right, so let's, uh, let me go in as root. Okay, I'm in as root, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get my package. Now, this uses PKG. I explained that last time. It's very much like APT. If you know uh, Debian or Ubuntu structure, the commands, you'll find exactly the same. For the most part. And we're just waiting for, to see if I actually have a network here. I guess that's the first thing. And this will take a little bit because it's got to refresh and, and the cache. So I'll be back when this is done. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So that's done. So I guess if I want to see what to do next, uh, the, the, I'll need to go back to the FreeBSD site. And I'll just show you where to find this. <clears throat> We'll go into the handbook and right here where it talks about the X-Window system, installing X-Org. So the first thing it suggests that I do is a PKG install X-Org. So I'll just do that. Uh, however, I also know the second step, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. I'm gonna get HTOP while I'm in here. I'm gonna get NeoFetch while I'm in here and glances and get this will take a while <laughs> so that's a lot of packages let me tell you yeah <laughs> 643 this will take some time and i'll be back unless you really want to sit here and watch this i can uh i can uh read a book while to you if you like like we could read war and peace together i'll be right back okay that's all done finally <laughs> I don't know what baud, what baud rate this is running at. <laughs> Man, that took forever. Uh, all right, so the next thing I need to do is to get over here into Etsy and edit my FS tab. And I'm going to add a proc file. I'll mount it on proc. And it's proc FS. Options are read write. And then we have a dump and a pass of zero. So that is for GNOME. GNOME requires that. And then we'll go into the RC at, uh, config. And we got a few things to do here. First thing we need is dbus enable equal yes. Uh, we need the hardware abstraction layer. And I, I forgot something. I always comment this.
so that I can come back to it and know what the heck I did. So the next thing I need is I need the ability to sign on. So I need to enable, oops, I'm doing good today, uh, GDM enable. And then I need to enable the GNOME services. I think I showed you some of this last time, but they've added a couple of things, and I'm going to just go ch double check this just to make sure I didn't leave anything out from memory. So let's go down here to X Windows and Desktop Environments, and then on GNOME 3, it'll show you there's the DBus enable, yes, and there's the hardware abstraction, GNOME enable equal yes and GDM enable yes those two and then there's a couple other methods you can you can use if you want to use XDM I don't want to use XDM but um, but yeah there's a couple other things you can do if you do this method just make sure that this is executable otherwise it won't come up uh, so uh, anyway that's all I need and hopefully we can reboot this and we'll just let it do its thing. <clears throat> if I did everything right, <laughs> it should come up. If not, we'll get to check and see what we did wrong and then fix it. But yeah, all right. So let's go ahead and hit one, which is the default. It should pop up with the login and then briefly and then it'll the screen should flip by the way I was going to tell you that um, BSD so back in the day when Unix was being developed it was originally written in assembler and during the course of that, they wanted to move to different machines while well, assembly is very difficult to do. So they had been building uh, uh, they had been building the C language compiler. And so uh, once they got that done, they they re did all of the Linux or excuse me, the Unix uh, software in C. And the first machine outside of Bell Labs to receive Unix was, uh, the one using the C version of Unix and the DEC PDP 11. I don't know if it was a 45 or a 70, but that doesn't really matter. But the PDP 11 was the first machine ever to receive the Unix with the C compiler uh, as and the C code as the basis. And oddly enough, it was that same machine that developed BSD. Uh, so, yeah. So just a bit of history there, in case you ever wanted to know that. Somebody ever asked you on it, on, I don't know, on some trivia test, I guess. So it looks like I have two cursors again, but hopefully we can get these converged, and then the other one will go away. So we're up. Uh, what I'm going to do is take that up to full screen, and then hopefully, let's see, did I get my cursor back? Yes, I did. Yay. Okay, so just looking at this, this is the GNOME browser, and we have a file manager, and then we'll probably have a whole bunch of games. <laughs> Seems like they always put a whole bunch of games on this one. So what I want was this one right here, so I'm going to add that to favorites. I'm also going to add this to favorites, and then I also have tweaks. So we can do a number of things right now. But the first thing I want to do is to straighten out this mess. Yeah, oops, that looks like a, a bug. Yeah, we got the wrong font loading, so we'll fix that. There, that probably took care of it right there. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger just so you can see what I'm doing as usual. And this has the same thing where you can you can select. Now this only applies to your terminal window, of course. Uh, and so, yeah, that straightened that out. So let's see. The other thing is we'll need tweaks to get our environment set. Where'd you go? 
There you are. <clears throat> so let's let's fix this so I don't go blind. Let's we'll change it to dark. And uh, okay, so we should be all good there. Uh, as far as the background is concerned, uh, you'll notice that it also darkened the background, which is nice. <clears throat> which is nice. Uh, let's see what they have here. Oh my God. I don't think I'd like that one. Uh, I think I'll choose that one though. Yeah, it looks all right. <clears throat> now, as far as what is this taking? So now I have ZFS running and it's about 1.3 gig. And I'll bet most of that is probably ZFS, but yeah, it's, it's taking quite a bit of memory. Um, as far as the storage, however, I'm at 3.9 gig, and I installed Xorg, GNOME, and all those all of those games, as well as HTOP, Glances, NeoFetch, and so forth. So I should get now if I ran this before I installed GNOME, I wouldn't get as much information back, of course, because we don't have a DE up and we didn't have a window manager or a theme or anything like that, which is now being reported correctly. So, and that's even showing 1.2 gig uh, in use. So let's take a look at glances and see what we got there as far as, yeah, 1.2 gig um, is what it's showing as well. So yeah, GNOME is heavy. I did try again to install, I did try to XFCE this time I made a mistake when I did it, so it didn't come up. But I'm sure it will if you follow the directions correctly. I just made I just made a mistake when I was doing it, and that's just telling me I need to I can if I want install a newer version of Glances. I don't. This is fine. Um, I think the only other thing is. I probably would need to install sudo at some point too because you really shouldn't allow this you should disable and one thing I did see that I thought was kind of weird I haven't seen this in a long time where now maybe it's just been away from BSD so long that uh, they, they were born for the board shell they reversed the root and there's two users out here at zero zero I'll tell you what Linus is not going to like that uh, we can run it, but I guarantee you Linus will flag that. It won't, it'll complain about it. So let's, So I don't, I'm not expecting a real high score just because of that. Yeah, I won't like to see multiple users with this with a zero um, UID. So yeah, it flagged me pretty heavily there. It's down to 52. Let's just scroll up and see what we got. So yeah, so the first thing we have is users with UID found, accounts found with same, and it says multiple accounts were have multiple have the same ID. Now, it doesn't like that at all, and it says yeah, you sh this is the part where when we were bringing it up, it asked me if I wanted to have a password on the console. I remember so a story. So um, back in the day when we had TWM as the only window manager for for Unix, of course, there was no login. It just you just powered up your terminal and you were logged in. Uh, but uh, I remember we had a guy that was kind of a practical joker, and so he would sneak on and he would he would use your terminal and send love notes to your boss. You know, usually in the middle of the night, he was a second shift worker. Well, I actually think he was first shift. But every time that he did that to us, we would do something to him. And so you know, the first time he did it. Uh, we he drove a VW Bug. The first time he did it, we had two guys on second shift that both drove pickup trucks. 
And so they parked on either side of him, and then four of us went outside and twisted his bug around uh, so that it was instead of so, so it was crossways between the two trucks. And the second time, and then he did it again. The same, so this time we uh, we took a coat hanger and pushed it. Now the bugs back then had a wing, so you could push a coat hanger through, grab, and pop the door handle. And uh, so we took it, took it, took it out of gear and pushed it. We had a freight elevator that would handle, I don't know, some god awful amount of weight. And so we took that, we took his bug, we put it in the freight elevator, we took it up to the top floor. I think that was about six floors up in that building. And then we rolled it down the hallway, and we had two doors on either side that we could lock. And there was only the assistant men that had the key. And so the system man locked it, and then he went home for the night because he was on first shift, so he was done. And uh, and we told him, we said, if he did it again, we had something really special planned for the third time, and uh, and so he never never gave us any problems again. So anyway, that was before we had account logins. I thought I, that's how we used to deal with the situation back then uh, when people would do that. So, yep. <laughs> Unix, Unix was never very secure until they decided to add logins. That was added later. Um, so let's see. What else do I want to do here? Uh, I didn't see any office utilities. I just see a bunch of games <laughs> and a bunch of other utilities. Yeah. So I probably, if I was going to use this for any length of time, I would take all these games off. But uh, and probably put on something serious. Um, but you know, you have that's a CD burner calendar. What do we got for mail? That evolution, okay. <clears throat> oh, that's the backup. But there, I must have hit, did I hit something twice. Or to just pop up with so I thought evolution was email. Yeah, that goes back a ways. I remember using evolution. I haven't used it in years. Um, I don't even know what version this is. I haven't used that in so long. It's part of GNOME though. Um, do 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 do. Of course, I I think. Let me get out of there and do a package search. Well, wait, before I do that, that should be out here. Yeah, it is. Oops, keep wanting to do a sudo. I hope this doesn't take as long as it did the last time. Man, that was slow. <clears throat> it, there's something going on. That's not right. That should not be that slow. I'll be back. I don't want you guys to have to wait. So I found my problem. It's, it's configured that as a 100 base T. So I went out. I've been having this issue with, uh, with Pop OS ever since one, the last update, but it, it, you know, I just did a iPerf and it's showing one gig speeds on the natives. So it could be something just with boxes. Yeah, it could be just something with boxes. Um, I think S tool is out here. Yeah. Let's just look. E N. Yeah, that is correctly set. The only thing is that I don't usually do that. I don't leave that as auto negotiation because you can get switches sometimes can get confused and then they'll they'll start they'll say, Oh, I think you need to be a hundred a hundred base. So or ten base, even worse. So I usually just set it no, you don't get the only Usually you set one side to auto negotiate, but not both. If you do set both, you'll it'll it'll get completely confused sometimes. 
So I don't know if that's part of the problem, but this is obviously is something to do with KB, with uh, with boxes and KVM. More than likely QEMU. So yeah, I'm sure there's a fix for that, but it's almost it's a minute away. So I'll be back. Oh well, at least they got one thing right. Got <laughs> full duplex at least not half duplex uh, okay so I should have Firefox and Thunderbird here somewhere yep it's right there so I will add this to my favorites and we will slide this well no no, yeah, it went to a different window, didn't it, or did it? And then we'll just remove that one. There we go. <clears throat> nope, I don't think so. I don't think I want to do that. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, it's going to Google. Well, we can straighten all that. Now that seems all right. That that doesn't seem too bad. Um, but it's kind of a trip down memory lane. I remember what 100 megabit <laughs> networks are like. They're pretty bad. Okay, so I guess um, you know we could explore some more. But uh, you know it. Uh, Let's see, yeah, we have our frequency. Well, it doesn't seem, well, yeah, it does. Now, can I just drop, nope. It, well, it's gonna let me drop it inside there. It doesn't seem to wanna let me move it yeah, it doesn't let me reorder it, but it will let me combine them. Probably would do it more with this. That's a that that's a simulator. That's a game. Twenty forty eight, but yeah. I think that's as far as I'm going to go with this tonight. You do have extensions here, uh, the GNOME extension. So if you don't, if now you shouldn't put on too many that's a good way to trash your system uh, because they don't always update <laughs> when the core gnome updates and so sometimes your extensions will break but uh, yeah that's all I've got I think for now I'm gonna go figure out that problem and I'll probably leave some kind of note as to what I find as to why it's decided to pick that uh, hunter base T that's not good uh, <laughs> that's completely wrong so anyway, let me uh, let me shut this down, and I'll work on this later. One thing about BSD, it's a two-stage shutdown. Although this will take care of both parts when you're doing it from inside a gnome but if you're on if you're just using this from just the the, the console window uh, you would do a shutdown and then a halt or a power off uh, either way a, halt, a, a shutdown or a, or a halt or you could, and then you would do a power off to get it to, to leave that's that's always been like that as far as I know <clears throat> so that's all uh, that's all I had for this time um, Trying to find a piece of hardware, I, I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try to find a piece of hardware and move this onto it. I, I have a Lenovo laptop. They work pretty well, as usually, with FreeBSD, so I'll probably try to put it on, on actual hardware. As far as the NUC is concerned, I think I'll drop back to an older one that I have and probably try to install it there and let you guys know how well that goes. Um, 
Yeah, I, I don't think it'll. I mean, I don't think I'll run into that problem with it picking the wrong speed on an Intel uh, on an Intel uh, network card. But this one uses a Realtek, and yeah, that's kind of goofy. This is my laptop that always gives me problems with Linux, so it's also repeating itself with FreeBSD. And anyway, I hope you enjoyed this uh, look at FreeBSD uh, 12.2. I think I mean it is a maintenance release. It it does have it does update it and refresh it quite a bit. Um, I think I I mean I noticed I went in there and I looked at OBS since I use OBS a lot. I noticed that the NDI drivers were there, the web interface was there, the web camera was there, and so I think I might just try this out uh, for a couple of weeks and see how I like it. Um, I really like want to stay on Linux though because that's what that's what I, I like the most. I mean, BSD is nice, but it's kind of in the past uh, for me anyway. And uh, I'm not sure um, if I want to make that my daily driver, but I'll be willing to try it for three weeks and just see what happens, and then give you guys a report back on how well it worked out. Anyway, that's all I had. Hope to see you again real soon, and uh, please like and subscribe. Bye for now.